Russian troops. Obviously, uh, this war is growing more fierce by the day. Uh, the Journal also talking, Richard, about uh, a, a topic that we discussed uh, offline, and that is the United States and European allies. How are we standing shoulder to shoulder moving forward into the winter? I think we're okay in the short run, but underneath the surface, Joe, there's a really uneasy difference of opinion. And the question is, what's the definition of success here? Is it that Ukraine right. be an independent, sovereign entity? Is it, does it have to recover every last inch of its territory going back not just to, 20, you know, to 2014 or to 1991? Does it have to recover it using arms as opposed to maybe long-term sanctions and diplomacy? What I think this is, it shows there's a real unease, a lack of firm consensus. And I think over time, this is obviously something Putin's looking at, whether over time some of the splits in the West come out. But I do think these are legitimate issues. And we can't basically say if you raise these questions, you're somehow unprincipled or you're unpatriotic. I think there's real issues here about how do we define success? What's our timeline? What are our means to achieve it? And I think under the surface, what's there, sooner or later, we're going to have to start discussing these more directly. Well, and Richard, it, it doesn't just break one way like the, the Europe wants to be more permissive than the United States. You look at the Baltic states, you look at Poland, of course, Finland uh, are, are, are actually going to take, we can already predict, they're going to want to take a much tougher line against Russia than even the United States. What, you know, you ask any leaders of those countries that I just mentioned, what, how do you define victory? And it's all Russian troops are out of Ukraine Every inch. Every inch. There's no exception to that. The United States is not going to take as an absolutist of a position, just like a lot of countries in Central Europe are. So it is. Explain how this is not just sort of a U.S. versus Europe, that you actually have divisions inside of Europe. The further you are away from Russia, perhaps the more permissive you might be on what those settlement terms would be. Uh, so there are going to be a lot of countries pushing and pulling uh, to, to try to get U Ukraine's ear uh, for any, any settlement that might come this spring. 100%. You have splits within Europe. You have splits within the United States. Uh, again, whether every square inch of territory has to be covered, if so, you, through the use of military force, you've got splits about uh, war crimes about accountability, about the willingness to still do business with Putin. You've got economic reparations issues, whether that should be part of the, the, the mix. So I think you know, all of this is there. These are, legitimate, these are legitimate subjects. And the fact, Joe, in the last, what, 72, 96 hours, Putin has reintroduced threats of nuclear use. I actually think will exacerbate some of these conversations. The question is going to be how, how yeah. demanding. How aggressive ought we to be in our definition of war aims now that he's reintroduced the nuclear threat? So th you know, th this never gets resolved. And I think on both sides of the ocean, these are, these, these are real and these are serious issues. Richard Haas, thank you very much. As we dive right into the second hour of Morning Joe, one of the most prominent voices on the far right made alarming comments over the weekend about the attack on the Capitol. And, and, and by the way, not just one of uh, the, the, the most outspoken voices on the far right, but also one of Kevin McCarthy's closest she's allies. Emerging, yeah. She's emerged as one of Kevin McCarthy's closest allies in him getting the speakership. Um, uh, Georgia Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene gave a speech at the New York Young Republican Club on Saturday night. She brought up a number of topics, some of them very disgusting um, and pornographic, and then the topic of January 6th and past accusations that she gave capital tours to Donald Trump's supporters in the days leading up to the insurrection. Green then reportedly said, quote, then January 6th happened. And next thing you know, I organized the whole thing along with Steve Bannon. Green went on to say, I will tell you something. If Steve Bannon and I organized that, we would have won. Not to mention it would have been armed. As Joe said, her comments matter because of her influence with the ultra-conservative Freedom Caucus and the group's ability to block Kevin McCarthy's bid to become Speaker of the House. Well, and, and as, as uh, Jonathan O'Meara, as, as you were talking about earlier uh, at, at the end of your show, uh, Axios is reporting that, that she has been working very closely 
very closely with Kevin McCarthy. Uh, and, and she is now one of Kevin McCarthy's most important allies in becoming speaker. And this is a woman who had said, you know, if, if she had been in charge of the January 6th riots, uh, they would have won and they would have been armed. That's Kevin McCarthy's Republican Party. One of McCarthy's top lieutenants. Uh, McCarthy has made a play to the far right of the Republican House caucus since January 6th, since he condemned briefly Donald Trump. And he has realized he needs to curry favor with the right in part in order to make sure that Donald Trump is still on his side to support his speakership bid. So he has spent now nearly two years trying to downplay some of the terrible things the extremists have said to not punish them when and obvious other member, other uh, leaders would have doled out stripped committee assignments or, or punished Republican members for saying or doing some of the things they did. Instead, he has placated them. He has wooed them. He has courted them because he knows he needs their support. And Marjorie Taylor Greene damn well knows that. And she knows that she's got a lot of power coming in right now. Mm. She's trying to get garner support for McCarthy to get him across the finish line to become speaker. And he is going to owe her greatly. If he becomes speaker, she he will be in her debt and her power will only increase. And that, that, what we just heard, those terrible remarks, that will be given a place of prominence within the Republican Party as it takes yes. control of the House in a matter of weeks. We've got a great group to talk about all of this. MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle joins us, former chief of staff to the DCCC, Adrian Elrod, and former aide to House Speaker Paul Ryan and House Speaker John Boehner, Brendan Buck. He's now an MSNBC political analyst. Good to have you all on board this morning. So, Brendan, uh, you know a bit about uh, House leadership races and the deals that, that people make and sometimes the deals that people walk away from. Uh, Kevin McCarthy is now uh, staking his, his speakership on a woman who this past weekend said that if she were in charge of the January 6th riots, that her side would have won and they would have been armed. Uh, how does that define Kevin McCarthy moving forward if he continues uh, to, uh, to cozy up to, to somebody who's talking about an armed insurrection? Yeah, you got to go back and look at the fact that Kevin McCarthy was inches away from being speaker in 2015, had it taken away from him by the Freedom Caucus, and he has vowed that he's not going to let that happen again. And obviously, uh, it's the far right that is uh, that is threatening him. And so he needs somebody to go in there. And, and basically, you're talking about envoys. I think Marjorie Taylor Greene is his envoy to these people uh, on the far right. And it, his strategy, basically, from the beginning was give them anything they want. Uh, if I, my jaw dropped. I remember thinking about when he named Jim Jordan to be on the Intelligence Committee, if you remember, during impeachment. Jim Jordan is now the chairman or going to be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to get her committees back. He doesn't really have any other path forward other than giving them what they want. Now, they're going to make a bunch of demands, but basically his argument is, I've given you everything. There's nothing else that you can, you can ask from me um, and hope that the rest of the conference loses patience with them. Now, you know, Mike Barnacle, it wasn't so long ago that Steve King had all of his committee assignments taken away from him by Republicans uh, for, for saying things that actually look very mild compared to what uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene said this weekend. And again, here's somebody talking about uh, an insurrection and talking about how it should have been armed. You know, Joe, there's, there seems to be a consensus that Kevin McCarthy is of limited ability. And he has made so many deals thus far. Just listening to Brendan reminded me of this. He's made so many deals thus far over the past three or four years in his pursuit of becoming speaker that he can no longer remember what deals he made. If you want to know the future of the Republican Party, as you were discussing quite articulately last hour, take a look at the cover of the New York Post this morning, Eyes on the Spies. And it's the Republicans' intention Kevin McCarthy's intention to subpoena 51 former members of the American intelligence community to pursue the Hunter Biden story. So if you're out there sitting at home, if you're out there sitting at home worried about your oh home heating oil bill, your grocery bill, the status oh of your kids in school, forget about that because themselves. we've got to get really to the can. bottom of the Hunter Biden story. We've got to cut Clapper and but Brennan in and find out why before? they lied. 
Yeah, no, we, 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 seen we have seen this before. They go it after Joe Biden's remaining son. You know, the people like Joe again. Biden, they, this is, has been, we've gone through this. Well, Haven't we gone through this? The thing is, let the chips fall where they may. Uh, if Hunter Biden uh, has done anything wrong, the DOJ is investigating Absolutely. him. Let the chips fall where they not, may. Not saying but that. this singular obsession, though, yes. as I've said before, they're in a bubble. And it causes them to lose. Now, as everybody knows, the New York Post, it's the official paper of Morning Joe. So I don't have to speak ill of the New York Post. I will say they got way ahead of themselves on Durham's hilariously bad investigation. Just like the Wall Street Journal had some op-ed writers got way ahead. Every time. They go down this path and they want to investigate the investigators. They want to attack the FBI. They want to attack the CIA. They want to attack the intel community. It never pays off for them. And Jen, if you look at this, the obsession, again, the obsession among these House Republicans on Hunter Biden's laptop, the obsession on Twitter, Adrian, the obsession uh, on on January 6th because They think we're treating the rioters, the insurrectionists, the terrorists too tough. And then you've got one of the most important players in getting Kevin McCarthy the speakership saying her regret is that they didn't bring guns to the insurrection. I mean, again, this is just proving my point. Republicans are in a bubble. They're going to keep losing. They're going to keep losing elections. Because they're not talking about inflation. They're not talking about health care costs going up. They're not talking about how hard it is for first time home buyers uh, to, to, to get a house. They're not talking about the kitchen table items that matter the most to Americans who decide elections. Yeah, Joe, you're exactly right. I mean, newsflash to Marjorie Taylor Greene and Kevin McCarthy, the tactics that you've been using the rhetoric that you've been espousing over the past two years, over the past six years, has not been working. Joe, you've talked about this time and time again on this show. Republicans have lost consecutively since 2016. Every cycle has gotten worse and worse and worse from them. 2022 was not a good midterm cycle for them at all, historically a bad midterm cycle. And it doesn't seem like they're getting the memo. I mean, you have Marjorie Taylor Greene using this crazy device of dangerous rhetoric because you mentioned making some really um, lewd comments that pornographic comments i mean this is not what the american people told elected officials politicians in washington that they wanted in the 2022 midterms they told um, elected officials we want government to work we want an effective and efficient government that's fighting for us that is working on the policies that matter to our american families uh, th- this is not what they stood for. And look, you know, we, I heard you guys talk earlier about uh, President Biden's numbers going up, his approval numbers going up significantly over the past few weeks. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that Americans are looking at what um, the Republicans are saying, and they're saying our top priority is to investigate Hunter Biden's laptop. Um, I think the more and more they try to get this, these frivolous uh, matters out there and say this is what we want to talk about meritless matters for for that matter um it, it's, it's only going to make B- biden's approval numbers going up because he is delivering for the american people and that is what um that's what uh, people signed up for in the 2022 midterms well now it's hunter and whatever else but do you remember mm-hmm. their obsession with we got to get rid of obamacare we got to get rid of it we're going to get rid of it and then they had nothing nothing well they've had no alternative never well, and Brendan, they bring Brendan, nothing. Here's the thing: you can't beat something with nothing, unless you're running against Kerry Lake in Arizona, and then you don't have to campaign. But thank God for that. I say that as an American that loves democracy. She won. She won. That's fine. But usually, you can't beat something with nothing. And 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 to talk about just how lost this Republican Party is intellectually, I mean, we go back to 2020. My former party, your party, didn't even have a platform in 2020. They had no ideas other than let's just follow the reality TV show host. Yeah, politics has become entertainment. And that's what you see with Marjorie Taylor Greene. So what happened when you elect an online troll to Congress. Uh, ideas matter a whole lot less. And, you know, I completely agree with Adrian that the, at large, the American people are not asking for us to get to the bottom of, of Hunter Biden's laptop. 
The problem for Republicans is a lot of Republican voters are asking that. And that is the world that most of these members live in. They all live in, most of them, in these deep red districts where they're watching Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity talk about this every night. And so that's what they're having to respond to. I don't think that Kevin McCarthy actually thinks there's a whole lot of national security threat from Hunter Biden at this point, but he's responding to what his members want. And his members are responding to voters, Republican voters. And this is the stuff that they are asking about. And as long as long as they can't break out of this cycle, we're going to continue to do things that people don't care about. We're probably going to get Joe Biden reelected by overreaching. But, you know, I was I, I came from a district that Jerry Falwell said was the most conservative district in America. You hold town meetings, you talk to people about these things. They say things like, they can pry my gun from my dead cold hands. You go, thank you very much for your comment. Let me tell you what I'm doing on capital gains and how I believe it's going to grow the economy. Like, it's not that hard. And, and, and as long as they are captive to these bright red districts and they can't do two things at once, they're going to keep losing. And they're talking now about guns on January 6th. They're going to try to help rioters and terrorists from January the 6th. They're going to do all of these crazy extreme things. They're going to focus and obsess on Hunter Biden's laptop. And again, uh, Jonathan Amir, uh, it's not like I'm, I'm hiding my cards here. I keep saying to my former Republican brothers and sisters, I'm trying to help you win they elections. They definitely are not listening. I'm trying to help you. And, and, and Jonathan, I just, if you could help me out here. Oh, uh, here we go. Um, help me out here. Uh, using this approach, this Trump approach, um, help me out here. In 2017, <laughs> did Republicans win or lose the, the off, off year elections in Virginia and the local races in 2017? Mm, mm. Uh, they lost. They lost. Okay, hold on. 2017. Okay, right. Let's yeah. go to 2018, the midterm elections. Uh, did they win or lose? Uh, they lost that one as well. They lost. Okay, hold on a second. So they yep. lost 2017, 2018. You would think this would um, be over six. Okay, so you think they figured that out. So in 2019, there were governor's races in places like Louisiana, Kentucky, the reddest of the red states. I'm sure they won those, right? Or did they win or lose? Uh, checking here. No, it looks like they lost. <laughs> Oh, they lost. Okay, that's a surprise. Okay, I'm sure they learned their lesson, though, by 2020, because they'd lost these governorships, and they, they, they lost the how, the... how did 2020 go? Did Republicans win or lose in 2020 using these tactics? Um, I have uh, no choice but to report that they lost again. Okay. All right, so so they lost 2017, 2018, 2018. Okay, now by my calculations, I'm really good at this. So I carry the three, yeah. divide by four. Okay, it looks like then that Donald Trump would have been the first president since Herbert Hoover, biggest loser, to lose the House, the Senate, and the White House in one term. Right, so. I'm thinking by 2022, I know Kevin McCarthy was saying he was going to win 60 seats. They're going to win by 60 seats. Red wave. And the Senate, I heard there's going to be a massive red wave. 2022, did they win or lose? They also had historical trends uh, in their favor. The yeah. party out of power right. tends to yeah. roll uh, in, the, in those off-year elections. Um, th that, did, that didn't happen. They, they captured the that House by a couple of seats. Yeah. The Democrats actually by 60? increased did their they margin. Did they do Kevin McCarthy 60? No, it was a handful. It was a handful, Joe, just a oh, handful. So, so uh, and lost. the Democrats so increased their margin in the Senate. Okay, now, if I'm not mistaken, they hadn't like lost, the sitting president yeah. had not uh, had all of the senators for his party return uh, since 1934, FDR. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me write that yeah. down. So it seems to me, Jonathan, that these Republicans that are living in this bubble, <laughs> living in this bubble. It's a bubble of loserdom. It is a bubble of, you would think that they would learn after 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 22, carry your four five. over three. That's four, five. about six years. Six years of just flat out losing. Five you would think they would learn by now. And, and serious question here. Uh, I, I got to believe the White House is just thrilled that they keep making these same mistakes. They keep living in this bubble. And they must be pretty happy, too, that Biden's approval ratings are going up. 
Well, during this little exercise here, the Republicans, Donald Trump was just compared to Herbert Hoover, and the Democrats and Biden were compared to FDR. Like, that's a pretty good uh, historical history. parallel. This White House would happily yeah. embrace that. Um, yes, uh, of course they are. They want the Republicans to be as extreme as they'd like. They worry about how the impact of the country. They worry about what that means in terms of legislative gridlock. But in terms of politics, yes, the Republicans are painting themselves in a corner. This connects to our conversation last hour about the bubbles and how the Republicans bubble is getting smaller and more extreme. And it seems out of step with the rest of the American people. And this is the Republicans have been trying now for six years to recreate what they had with the Hillary Clinton emails, which they were able to take the merits of the yeah. scandal off the table here. Just in terms of political tool, they were able to use it effectively to help win with some, mind you, four and outside assistance by WikiLeaks and Russia to win in 2016. And they've been desperate to find a sequel to that ever since. They've settled on Hunter Biden's laptop. It didn't work in 2020. It hasn't worked. It didn't work in the 2022 midterms. They're still going full steam ahead for 2023. And they would yeah. risk just being further out of touch than ever before. That's right. This is what I can't believe. The, 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 the extremism, they seem to get more extreme by the day. And Mike Barnacle, there are actually voices on the right. There are voices in the uh, United States Senate, Republicans in the United States Senate, trying to bring the Republican Party back a bit more centered to where, where swing voters will be more comfortable voting for them. Because it's not like swing voters are happy with progressives and are like, hey, that's a direction I want to go. It's not. But Democrats are feeding off of this Republican extremism. You know, we were critical, actually, of the Democratic, uh, these Democratic groups uh, spending a lot of money for the mm. most MAGA uh, election MAGA. denying uh, uh, people in the primaries. But they did it and it worked time and time again. These extremists that won the primaries lost. So at this point, again, Republicans should figure it out. Wait, they're using our extremism against us. If we want to start winning elections, maybe we need to push these people to the side. Joe, if you, if you do the autopsy, and you just did a brief autopsy of the past several elections uh, from 16 on, 16, 18, 20, 22, uh, the, the lesson that has been unlearned by the Republican Party, and it continues right through up until this very moment, is you can't win anything, really, if everything you do is based on two issues, resentment and revenge. And that's what they seem to be into at every level of the Republican Party. I mean, if it's not, uh, you know, Hunter Biden's laptop, it's, you know, how did Miss Griner get, get released? Why did we do that? It's terrible. If you read some of the comments about both issues uttered from elected Republicans in the House and some in the Senate, but mostly in the House, you wonder, my God, do they not know how real people live? Do they not know that no. real people worry about fuel bills, about grocery bills, about their children in elementary school or high school going to college? How, they, how can they afford these things? Do they not realize that there's a real America out there that they don't care they seem about Hunter detached. Biden's laptop? They, they're, they're, they're kind of happy that uh, Ms. Griner yeah. was released, that was, she was finally freed. Uh, right. So yeah. it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Yeah, but no, it's a mystery with an answer. There, there's this obsession, uh, like they aim politically to, to own the lips, and they end up just shooting themselves in the foot every single time, every single time. Let's bring in Jackie Alemany into this conversation. She's congressional investigations reporter for The Washington Post and an MSNBC contributor. And Jackie, you co-authored a new article for The Post entitled Congressional Republicans Divided on Attacking Trump Investigations. And you write in part, quote, the chasm between lawmakers who have continued to vehemently defend the newly announced presidential candidate and those who have started to quietly inch away from the former president widened last week as top GOP leaders laid out the party's investigative priorities. The emerging split raises another sign of Trump's uncertain position in the party. After a month in which he was widely blamed for a disappointing midterm and drew criticism for controversial statements. Jackie, talking about the divide, what is it? 
Yeah, well, we had an interview with my colleague Josh Dossi with Senator Lindsey Graham, one of uh, former President Trump's most outspoken allies who distanced himself from the former president and essentially said that when he uh, replaces Chuck Grassley as the ranking member on the Senate Judiciary Committee, he is not going to view his role as sort of an arm to defend the former president uh, in terms of attacking the FBI and the Department of Justice. You also had James Comer, who is going to lead uh, the very powerful Oversight Committee, which actually has subpoena power, which uh, and he'll also be a chairman as well, since the House GOP is taking over the majority. And he told CNN in an interview uh, that he also didn't view it his priority to uh, attack and continue to investigate the Department of Justice on their investigation into Trump's mishandling of classified materials. That being said, there are still very loud voices. Jim Jordan, Ron Johnson, along with uh, some new House GOP members who are going to be joining these committees, who, as uh, Brendan, I think, really, in, uh, you know, pointed out in an insightful way, sort of have bought into these perverted incentives um, to uh, try to exploit the news cycle to attack targets that don't actually exist. And so, yes, this chasm um, is starting to split and get a little bit more noticeable. But at the end of the day, uh, you're still going to see attacks writ large against the FBI and the Department of Justice, sort of along the themes of politicization at the Department of Justice, which does ultimately help the former president. Uh, but again, uh, you are seeing some uh, prominent former Trump allies at least saying that we're not going to explicitly attack some of the more criminal investigations that the Department of Justice is now looking at with regards to the former president. You know, Brendan, as a uh, conservative Republican, uh, I grew up, I campaigned. I campaigned in support of the intel community and always we always would bring up the church commission the church commission that we thought did damage to the intel community for years it is so interesting uh talk about just the changes how you have republicans the house republicans especially the trump republicans attacking institutions attacking the fbi the men and women the fbi attacking the department of justice attacking the united states military saying that they're woke and some senators is even saying, oh, I wish we were more like the Russians. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's insanity. But, but, but again, we, if you don't mind picking up on the theme, pick up on the theme on how discordant that is when you have a formerly a, a, a conservative party and some of its leaders just obsessed on attacking the intel community and the United States Armed Forces. Yeah, it's hard to square the party that we were even 10 years ago uh, that was running on strong national security. Uh, look, there are people, I think, in the House who do find this stuff uh, uncomfortable uh, and, and don't, don't want to see the, the, the House go down this route. My problem is that those people don't tend to stand up for themselves. You know, we've had a little flurry of late uh, of the moderates talking about how they're going to reassert their authority in the House. I, I have to just kind of shake my head at that because I've heard them say that they don't like the direction we're going quite a bit, but they never really do anything. The Tuesday group, uh, you know, the, the, the governing majority, they call themselves, uh, rarely speak up for themselves, really try to urge the party to go in a different direction. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. Uh, the reality is that Republicans don't think that we've had bad elections. And that's the, the real rub here. Uh, Republicans took away the 2016 election that you can ignore the middle. You can offend whoever you want, as long as you turn out enough base Republicans. And even though Trump lost the White House in 2020, Republicans had a better night than expected. So they interpreted that again as it's working for them, at least in the House, it's working for them. So they don't care who you offend. They don't care if the elites in Washington think that uh, you know, we should be protecting uh, our intelligence community. They think that, that, that you know those elites are the people who are attacking their, their constituents, or at least their constituents think that. So they've actually internalized these elections are going through as wins for them. And that's the ultimate paradox we're facing. Obviously, they weren't good elections, but from where they live in their district, the type of politics that they play, it's working for him. So, so Brendan, this really mm -hmm. underlines so what, what, what we've been saying here is that really three parties. There's the Democratic Party, there's the House Republican Party, and then there's the Senate Republican Party, right? Because obviously senators, uh, uh, Republican senators, look at what's going on uh, across the way uh, and just roll their eyes and can't believe how much it's hurting their chances to retake the Senate. 
Except in, in reaction to this, you're seeing the House or the Senate look a lot more like the House. You had a bunch of senators stand up and say they want to challenge Mitch McConnell, one of the few people in, in Congress who is looking out through the bigger picture, who understands that who you nominate in your primaries matters. And for the first time, you actually had a public challenge to his leadership. That's the type of stuff you see in the House. You don't usually see in the Senate. So I don't actually see a lot of people learning lessons. They're looking to uh, cast blame on other people. So um, maybe the Senate can can right our ship here. Obviously, that was a very disappointing outcome. Um, but there are signs that uh, it's, it's drifting the other way as well. Wow. Brendan Buck, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. And The Washington Post, Jackie Alamany, thank you as well for your reporting from The Washington you, Post. You know, Mika, it's almost like yeah. they, they don't hate losing as much as my mother did. Well, they're they like mini winning. What do you mean mini winning? Just like, like in certain areas. And I, I don't know. I mean, what I don't really see how what? the Lexington Herald leader reports that the government will stop subsidizing the COVID-19 treatment pill Paxlovid next year. Nearly six million Americans have taken the pill for free to prevent COVID-related hospitalization and death. Health officials say it will result in fewer people receiving life-saving treatments. In New Jersey, the Courier News reports that a task force has been created to counter a troubling trend of teacher shortages in the state. It aims to generate strategies that will boost the quality and quantity of the state's educational workforce. Among its members are a variety of school administrators and representatives. The Times Union reports that New Yorkers will soon be able to order cannabis products to their doorsteps. State regulators have unveiled new rules allowing licensed retailers to deliver weed and THC infused edible products. Deliveries can be made by bike, scooter, okay, so or car. How are we going to get Heilman into the studio? He'll never make it. He's, he's never going to leave his house. Nope. That's going to be a problem. The Atlanta oh Journal-Constitution covers the city's dip in gas prices. They're at their lowest level in more than a year, thanks averaging Biden. around, thanks to Biden, thanks $2.94 a, a gallon. The pump. That's a 35 per, 35% drop since prices peaked in June. By the way, on Twitter, yeah. which I don't, I get on Twitter, it looks Once different, while, it yeah. feels different. Mm. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't think it's going to work out. Well, but, but, but you know, I mean, it looks different feels like because everybody's everybody on Twitter is talking no, about Twitter. Something's going it's on. It's just kind of boring. The, but yeah, anybody, somebody tweeted that they just landed in Miami. Yes. And that it is the worst airport they have ever experienced in their life. It's horrible. Thanks, Ron DeSantis. Thanks, DeSantis. <laughs> for your terrible airport, just disgusting joking, We're urine on the floor. We're I'm not joking. joking. Yeah, but I mean, as far as it's like. I love how he we, could we do blame something. leaders. You think he can? Yes, he could. You think he could? Yes. Well, there are things you can well, look do. Look at that. I will say, Ron DeSantis, Miami Airport to fix the Miami Airport. The Miami Airport is heinous. It rated near the Escalators bottom. Escalators don't work. People rated, movers don't it work. It rated near the bottom, along with so gross. Laguardia. Well, they fixed up Laguardia. Well, no, they don't really fix it up. Jonathan O'Meara, did they fix up Laguardia or yeah, not? It's because kind of here's my up. deal. Okay. No, it's kind of gorgeous. No, actually. no, no, no. Because you get in there. And then you've got to walk to Pennsylvania. Well, I know Joe, that you every could use time, the walk. I know that every time I land yeah. at LaGuardia, like, it's I'm going to for you. I'm going to see Amish people taking the bags off. Up, right, because I'm in Lancaster, and then we got to walk back. I see, I see Harrisburg. No. I see, like, see. Uh, it's good for you to walk. I can put you in the suitcase and pull you if you'd like. Seriously, it's the longest walk. It, who thought? I of love that? the walk. Who said we're going to make a LaGuardia that stretches all the way out to Lancaster County? First of all, I'm impressed that Fort Lauderdale's airport's lobbying operation continues to score such points on this show as the alternative to flying into South Florida. Uh, LaGuardia no, Airport, no, no, that's... No, 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 hold on a second, hold on, hold on. The, so the three or four lowest rated airports, Is according Fort to a recent too? survey, <laughs> yeah, Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> Miami, Newark, and uh, and and uh, LaGuardia. Thanks, Ron DeSantis. So if you're that flying out of New, New York uh, into South Florida, lots of luck. So gross. Yeah. Here's the deal with LaGuardia. It's a it was a Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, push oh, uh, Governor. with infrastructure. You remember Thanks. him? Because uh, steer, steer, steering the Port Authority of New York, Jersey. Here, two things. This is a moment where, we, as we say on the show all the time, two things can be true at once. LaGuardia Airport is much nicer than it used to be, but it also is much bigger. So yes, that is a pretty common complaint about how long it takes to get from one side to the other. But Joe, they do have those little carts 
perhaps you could take yes, a ride next you time you need a transfer. Look, look, at, Mike, I, want, I, want, I want to tell you of everybody here this morning. I am at LaGuardia more than all of you combined. And I can tell you, if you've got one of those things on your phone counting your steps, your phone will explode going from (laughs) gate to to getting out of the airport. It's incredible. It's insane. And you You wonder, and you actually worry about really elderly people getting to the gate and then getting but, from oh, the true. gate back out to the airport to the corner to get a cab. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. The, this, the distances are almost overwhelming from the entry All to right. the airport to the yep. gate. It's, I'm focused it, on it, Miami. It, it's absolute insanity that, that there are times that you can get from Midtown out to LaGuardia faster than you can get yeah. from the parking lot in LaGuardia to your gate inside. Again, whoever planned this out, I will tell you, England played better than France up and down the pitch. I was, I really was shocked. Just like I'm used to uh, cheering for the U.S., but understanding they don't belong on the pitch with most teams, this year they did. Mm-hmm. And I cheer for England, always knowing they're going to be a step down from Brazil, a step down from Argentina, a step down uh, from the French. Not this year. England may have had the best team of the tournament this year. Well, Southgate has changed this team, revolutionized this team since 2014, when the country completely fell out of love with this team after Brazil and, and the debacle there. And he's just changed the outlook, the personality, the youth, the, you know, the style of the team. And we played, and we played with it. Look, we had Croatia beat in Russia in the semi-final, didn't finish it off. We had Italy beat at Wembley in the Euros, one didn't finish it off. We had France beat. And in my view, we were just a little bit too... It's one of the games you regret that we didn't win. We, we, we have them beat. They, were, they, are, they were, the, are the world champions. We played them off the park in many parts of the game. They were clinical and ruthless. Their first goal was right. a beautiful goal, but it was a foul before that by the, uh, on Saka. Oh. But look, you know, it's a definite yeah. foul. But look, it's a great first goal. Second goal was bread and butter premiership goal. But we have, you know, we played so well in that game that every English guy, look, we normally, we give up hope because hope has always killed us in yeah. the past. But with these group of players, right. there's a future for this team. Southgate's in a great yeah. team. He may stay, may go, but you know, this is a young team. 2026, right. it will be great. Euros will be great. But we should have, game we should have won. Game we should have won. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I hope he stays. Mm. I really do. Um, it, it, was, it was quite a performance. By the way, I can say this uh, as, as an American, an, an outsider, horrible, horrible raffing. Just, just hor- horrible officiating. I cannot believe that a game on that level had as bad officiating, as bad refs as it had. But they did. Uh, Jonathan O'Meara, I've got to ask you, we've got to bring up the set piece in the oh. 100th minute. Uh, the Dutch, the brilliant orange, what they were able to do in the 100th minute against Argentina. Just absolutely crazy. Yeah, spectacular. I'm sure we'll see it again in here. The beautiful pass. They were down mm-hmm. 2 nothing, all out assault to try to get in. They get one, make it 2 1. We're in extra time in the 100th minute. The pass, the setup through the line, good kick into the OM. 